to our scripture uh, this morning, 3rd John, verse 2. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, right and upcoming young ministers who are here with us today. Amen. Reverend Davis, amen. 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 Son of Pastor Eddie Davis, and I believe just two or three years ago graduated from American Baptist College in Nashville. Just this past May, amen, very recent graduate, amen. So we thank God, I was trying to put some time on him. He just graduated, amen. We're glad to see you uh, here on today, amen. Uh, 3 John verse 2, reading from the NIV says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. You may be seated and uh, as we are uh, continuing uh, our overall uh, series, uh, you'll find it noted on the front of our program, Finding True Value in Life. Uh, the second component of this series uh, in finding true value in life uh, coming from this text is entitled Living Life in the Black. Living Life in the Black. Amen? Amen. Now in financial circles, uh, to be in the red means to be in the negative, amen? amen? And to be in the black means to be in the positive. And so when we equate that to spiritual terms and spiritual reckoning, we'll find that incorporated and nestled in the prayer of the Apostle John is literally a prayer that this particular believer would live life in the black, amen? And I know that all of us endeavor not to live below the zero line, but to live above the zero line. Amen? And I want you to understand, as we get this prosperity issue in biblical perspective, and we'll have it in perspective before we finish our message on today, I want you to understand, even though some have gone to the extreme and misinterpreted scripture, we do need to understand that God wants us to live life in the black. Amen? We just got to understand what it means to live life in the black the way God wants us to, and not the way we desire to live it. Have I got a witness here today? And so we will notice my brothers and my sisters particularly, and I'll make reference to a number of scriptures, but Psalm 35 and verse 27 says that God delights in the well-being of his children. God is happy. God rejoices when his children are doing well. Have I got a witness here today? I want you to understand that God wants us to do well. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The psalmist said at the latter part of Psalm 27 I was about to give up if I had but believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We know that our souls are eternally saved. But we need to also understand the Lord wants us to live well right. here on earth. Right. But in order to live well here on earth, we've got to get the biblical perspective of what it means to be prosperous. The text says, John says, and he prays, beloved, I pray. I want you to understand something. The believer does not merely wish that things go well. We pray that things go well. Amen. Amen. Now, all of us have wishes and desires, but the distinction between a believer and an unbeliever is that the believer takes his or her wishes and desires and translates them into prayer, which is indicative of the fact that I'm not simply wishing and expressing my desires in just an open, indirect way, but I am expressing, making all my wishes and desires known to a God who can make them literally come true. And so he prays that he may enjoy good health and that all may go well with him even as his soul is getting along well. The King James uses the word prosper. And as we look at the word prosper in Greek, it literally means to have a good career. It literally means, my brothers and sisters, the, the, the word used in Greek for prosper is made up of two words. One word meaning to help on one's way, literally, or to be well on a journey. And so what the text is literally saying, he's praying that he would be well or it would be well with him while he is on his journey. It is literally saying in, in whatever circumstance he faces, may God prosper him. We need to understand that worldly prosperity means you just skate along, nothing ever goes bad, everything is good. But biblical prosperity means not that we won't be met with things that we don't like, but God will prosper us, God will bless us, God will give us joy and peace, God will do good for us even in the midst of these circumstances. 
so we have here a biblical view of ideal prosperity. The apostle prays that his friend Gaius may have temporal prosperity and physical health, but he also prays, and it helps us to understand there's nothing wrong with praying for those things. But then the apostle indicates a very remarkable transition that, that his physical and his financial prosperity must be closely aligned with his spiritual prosperity. He is saying here that in light of the fact that you are spiritually prosperous, in light of the fact that you put first things first, in light of the fact that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, in light of that fact that is beyond question, in light of the fact that you seek God for his faith and not his hand, in light of the fact that you love that all these temporal things will be elevated to the level of your spiritual life. And so I want you to understand something, my brothers and sisters. The first key to finding true value in life and the first key to stewardship is not the stewardship of your time. It is not the stewardship of your talent. It is not the stewardship of your time, but it is the stewardship of your soul. Because if you are not a good steward of your soul, which is eternal, he is not going to give you any more. See, when you look even at the parable of the talents, you got to take care of what you've already entrusted to God before he will entrust you with anything else. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? If you won't be a good steward of that which is of eternal value, he is certainly not going to If you won't read your Bible, if you won't pray, if you won't feed your soul, he's not going to give you no more money. Y'all not going to pray with me here today. So he says, in light, in light, my friend, of your spiritual prosperity, I pray, according to the word of God, that everything else would be in line as well. So when we talk about this profitable life, you need to understand we've got to be a good steward of the soul before we will be a good steward of temporal resources. Right. Illustration, the rich young ruler yeah. came to Jesus, said, Jesus, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know all the commandments. The man said, I'll follow all the commandments. Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell all of your possessions, give to the poor, then come follow me. The man said, I cannot do that. What we noticed in the text, the man considered stewardship of his temporal resources a greater priority than stewardship of his soul. He was willing to forfeit his soul for his temporal resources. He was willing to neglect his soul for temporal resources. But I want you to understand something. If you're going to do things God's way and do things the right way, you must be a good steward of the soul. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you do not have to chase worldly things. Worldly things will chase you. You don't have to chase all these things if you chase God. God said we chase him and God will bring everything else we need to fulfill his plan. Mark 8, 36, it says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole wide world and turns around and loses his or her soul? And so John says, or prays that the soul of his friend Gaius, he says, it was truly prosperous. And John expressed the desire that his friend's material prosperity and physical health may be in balanced harmony with the full, rich spiritual experience already evident in his life. It's a wonderful text. But John also would want us to understand my brothers and sisters. And I noticed uh, there's a book uh, by H. Wayne House and Kenneth Durham that's entitled Living Wisely in a Foolish World. And they share in that book that the problem when it comes to prosperity is one of improper or reversed priorities. The incorrect view of prosperity is that prosperity equals God's approval and therefore happiness. But that is incorrect. Prosperity is not equated or equivalent to having God's approval and having God's happiness. The correct view of 
your prosperity. Lifted from this text is that God's approval equals happiness. God must first approve of your soul. You must first have gotten your soul rightly aligned with God by means of salvation and by, by, by mere virtue of the fact that God approves of you. that soul. We are feeding that soul. We are acting as if that soul 